Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is John Robinson, and I lead the Advanced Materials and Processes competency within Pira Technology. And as a group, we get involved in a whole range of materials-based projects on polymers, composite materials, elastomers, inorganic materials, coatings, and in recent years, some projects involving nanomaterials, which is the topic of, uh, of my presentation this morning. Um, I'm relatively new to Pira Technology myself. I joined the company late last year, and for the 14 years prior to that, I was involved with, a, with an advanced materials development and manufacturing company specializing in nanomaterials. So I'm drawing on some of my prior experience in, in delivering this presentation this morning. In terms of content, I'm going to start off by saying something about what are nanomaterials and why are we so interested in this area. I'm going to give a couple of examples from my own experience of commercialization of products based on nanomaterials. I'll go on to say something about what the future might hold and where all of this might go before wrapping up with, with some conclusions. So in terms of what are nanomaterials, well, if you like, this is a material science-based approach to nanotechnology. <coughs> and in terms of definition, if you Google nanomaterial, you'll come up with a definition something like this. We're talking about materials where at least one external or internal dimension is at the nano scale, which generally means less than 100 nanometers, where 100 nanometers is 10 to the minus 9 of a meter, or if you like, a million times smaller than a millimeter, so very small. And this includes materials such as nanoparticles, which are particulate materials in which all dimensions of every particle are smaller than 100 nanometers. There's an image on the left-hand side of the screen there of some 20 to 30 nanometer nanoparticles. Includes things like nanotubes and nanorods, which are also particulate materials in which the diameter would be smaller than 100 nanometers, but the length could be very much longer. Also includes much larger particulates or coatings or surfaces um, which have features at the nano scale, which could be crystallites or porosity. And there's an image on, on the right hand side of the screen there showing some large nano uh, structured particles. These are also classed as nano materials. So, to put all of this into perspective in terms of size, what we're talking about, this is an analogy that I often like to draw upon. Um, a golf ball is something like 10 million times smaller than planet Earth, and in comparison, nanoparticles are something like 10 million times smaller than a golf ball. So we're talking about matter on a very, very small scale. Why are we interested in all of this, and why do scientists get so excited about nanomaterials? Well, it's because compared to more traditional equivalent materials, nanomaterials tend to have some very unique and exciting properties. Nanomaterials generally have very high surface areas, and this is the reason for a lot, of, a lot of these exciting properties. It depends very much on the material, but nanomaterials potentially are harder, stronger, even more flexible than more traditional counterparts. <clears throat> Again, it depends on the material, but often we'll see some unique optical, electrical, thermal, magnetic properties. One interesting feature of nanoparticles in particular is once the size becomes below a certain limit, the particles actually become transparent in dispersion. So that gives rise to some very interesting applications like transparent coatings, for example. What I would like to say is that these materials are not new. Nanomaterials have actually been around for years. Um, the carbon black material that's been used for many years to reinforce car tires is actually a nanomaterial. This probably just wasn't very well understood 50 or so years ago. Um, Photographic silvers in traditional photography were actually colloidal dispersions of nano silver. Um, and there's even been examples found of glazes used in pottery on ceramics from way back in the Ming Dynasty in China, which actually contain nano scale pigments. So these things have actually been around for centuries. But what, what you might call nano hype really began probably in the late 1980s, early 1990s, with advances in electron microscopy where it became possible to image at the nano scale. And for the first time, it became possible to actually see nanoparticles. And this opened up a whole new area of research that we call nanotechnology today, I guess. In terms of possible applications for nanomaterials, there are lots of them. I've listed some of these on the screen. This is by no means an exhaustive list. And I've tried to group those into broad 
application areas. These are very much overlapping application areas. I'm not going to go through any of those. The point that I wanted to make is that there's a lot of potential applications here. <coughs> Nanomaterials are, are going to find success in some of these areas more than others. And it really comes down to finding the right target application area. And in the next few slides, I'm going to give some examples um, from my own experience on commercialization of nanomaterials, which shows, I think, um, that products don't always develop along the lines that we expect. I mentioned earlier that for the last 14 years, I was involved with an advanced materials company. The company was called Antaria Limited, based in Western Australia. And that company was set up to commercialize some technology that we developed called Meccano chemical processing for the synthesis of, of nanoparticles. And the first material that we really studied in detail was ceramic oxide, sorry, cerium oxide nanoparticles. And cerium oxide is a very hard, abrasive ceramic oxide material. With our process, we could produce some very high quality cerium oxide nanoparticles. We had control over particle size. There's some images on the screen there that show the control over particle size that we had. And we could produce very high quality dispersions in liquids. So we were very, very excited about this. And the application area that we targeted for this particular material was ultrafine polishing of microelectronic components. And this is called CMP, or chemical mechanical planarization. When silicon chip devices are fabricated, these things are put down in layers. A layer is deposited on the silicon wafer. That layer has to be polished before the next layer can put, that, put down. That's called CMP. And because of the feature size, very, very small abrasive particles or nanoparticles are required. In the late 1990s, it was thought that cerium oxide was the next generation CMP material. And we had a very big partner who was thinking along similar lines. Korean company Samsung Corning invested a lot of money into our company and allowed us to set up a pilot plant to demonstrate scalability of the process. Technically, all of that was a great success, extremely successful. But commercially, uh, Neither Samsung Corning nor Antaria ever actually managed to sell a single gram of cerium oxide into the CMP market. And the reason for that was that the material just couldn't compete on price with the existing product, which were slurries based on colloidal silica, which didn't have all of the benefits and attributes of cerium oxide, but the price differential was too great, and that project was dropped. That could have been the end, and that could have been the end of a very nice piece of technology, but, however, things developed along a slightly different path than we expected. And we did develop successfully um, a commercial product based on this technology. In 2003, we were approached by a UK company called Oxonica, and they asked the question, do you have the technology to disperse cerium oxide nanoparticles into liquid? They had some IP associated with, with using this um, in fuel additives. And the answer, of course, was yes, and a, a brand new product that became known as Envirox was, was born. And I won't go into, into any of the details, um, but the Syria nanoparticles in the fuel actually acts, acts as a diesel combustion catalyst, catalyzes um, and improves the efficiency of combustion of diesel, leads to some improvements in fuel economy and reduction in pollution. That was a slow product initially to take off, but 10 years down the track, that product is still being used in various parts of the world and is growing. And probably the most famous example in this country <coughs> is the Stagecoach Bus Company, <coughs> that's been using that product in their fleet of buses since 2004, I think. So we did develop a success story from something that at one point we thought was going to be a failure because we chose the wrong application initially. The other example that I wanted to say something about was process technology we developed for the synthesis of aluminium oxide particles with unique plate-like shape, or alumina particles, if you like. You can see them on the screen there. So these particles had a diameter something like 10 micron, but the thickness was 100 nanometers or so. And we were very excited about this, and we immediately started to chase some application areas, primarily in hard coatings. This is aluminium oxide, corundum, the second hardest material after diamond. And we envisage creating some very, very thin, adherent, <coughs> potentially transparent, hard, scratch-resistant coatings, which we thought was a very exciting area. We looked at other areas too, such as advanced ceramics. We did look at lubricants. One interesting feature of this material, if you dip your fingers into this powder and rub your fingers together, it felt extremely slippy. 
as these platelets were sliding relative to one another. It's another area we explore. We explored additives for polymers, but the end result, after a lot of time and a lot of money was spent on all of this, this material was just unable to compete with existing materials in these areas on price. And the reality was you could buy run-of-the-mill alumina powders for, say, $3 a kilo, didn't have all of the nice attributes that this material had, but compared to the $50 a kilo that we needed to charge for this material, we couldn't compete. So once again, this was almost the end of a great piece of technology. But there was a, a, a happy ending because things, again, developed along a very different path, quite by chance. Um, we had a marketing person at an exhibition with uh, a booth set up and with a sample of this powder out on the table. Purely by chance, the company in the booth next door was from a, um, a cosmetics ingredients manufacturer. The lady from that company took one look at the powder, felt it and said, this is absolutely fantastic. You need to find a way to get that into cosmetics. So that set a whole different thought path for us. We did some work, some investigation, and we figured out that the material had some very interesting optical properties and we could promote that as a soft focus effect pigment in cosmetics, which was something we never, we never dreamed of. Um, we developed a product called Illusion, based on that which became quite successful, so much so that in 2009, German chemical company Merck became interested in what we were doing and we licensed this technology to Merck. So they, they then took that product into their range of functional cosmetic pigments and we, uh, we entered into some collaborative R&D aimed at extending that product into a wider range of pigments for high-end automotive paints and polymers and other things. So a very successful outcome, but again, quite different to what we expected. And for us, cosmetics was a very surprising market. As, as a bunch of scientists, we, we discovered these wonderful things and we had all these ideas of application areas that that product could go into. None of us ever dreamed of cosmetics. And that brought about a complete change of thinking for that company. And now Antaria focuses entirely on the aluminium oxide product and on dispersions of zinc oxide for cosmetics and sunscreens. This is an area where I think we're going to see quite a bit of growth. Um, I tried to find some, some market data. It's, it's not easy to find. There's a suggestion from one source that at the end of last year, the total market for nanomaterials and cosmetics was something like 155 million US dollars. Another source suggested that by 2015, zinc oxide and titania for UV absorption alone in personal care would be something like 280 million dollars. I think this is an area that's really going to grow and really going to take off. And, and I think the question is, that's an area that we didn't anticipate. Where else can nanotechnology go that we haven't thought of as yet? Um, so in terms of what does the future hold, uh, if, you, if you take a look at where we are now, again, I tried to find some market data, but it's very difficult, and you find conflicting information. And one source that I found there suggested that in 2010, the total nanomaterials market globally was something like 1.7 billion US dollars. Another source suggested that it was nearly $10 billion. So there's, there's quite a difference. I think it depends how we define the market and are we including things like carbon black or, um, or not. But one thing that is consistent in all these sources is everyone is predicting some very strong growth um, in nanomaterials. So where might all these things go and where might these nano products go? There's a suggestion that by 2015 the total market could be something like 20 billion US dollars and one particular source is suggesting that the lion's share of that will be in the electronics area, things like battery materials, capacitor materials, um, the large chunk in the environmental area, essentially catalysts, um, energy, things like fuel cells, maybe fuel catalysts as well, and smaller but not insignificant slices in biomedical and consumer areas, and other, which could be absolutely anything that maybe we haven't thought of yet. One reason why it's difficult to find predictions much beyond, say, 2015 is that nobody really knows. Um, it's very hard to predict these things. New innovations keep coming along which muddy the waters. And one of these, I guess, is, is graphene. You really can't go to a nanotechnology event these days without half of it being dedicated to graphene. This has been touted as you know, the next super material. So graphene was, was discovered by some researchers in Manchester in 2004, and it's essentially a single atomic layer of carbon, so a honeycomb or chicken wire type arrangement of atoms in a sheet, a bit like a single layer of, of graphite. And in the lab, 
It's been shown that graphene has some extreme properties. It's been touted as being as hard as diamond, as flexible as rubber, some exceptional electronic and thermal um, conductivity, very high surface area like all nanomaterials, and highly transparent, which is giving rise to all sorts of interesting application ideas. Um, the question is where will it really go? Nobody knows. There's an awful lot of money being put into graphene research and development at the moment in terms of developing um, applications and, and processes. Where will it go? It's hard to say. Um, in terms of commercial exploitation of graphene right now, it's almost zero. Um, <coughs> there are some suggestions that by 2015 we'll start to see some commercialized products based on graphene with some very strong growth predicted out to to 2020 dominated by electronics. That blue um, bar there is, is capacitor materials based on graphene. And they're suggesting a market of around half a billion US dollars by, by 2020, which is quite, quite remarkable if it's true. So no one really knows, that's the thing. Um, but in, in conclusion, is there a bright future for nanomaterials? Well, I, I think undoubtedly there is. There are challenges and there are things that will limit and slow down introduction of new products based on nanomaterials. From the two examples that I gave, one is clearly cost competitiveness. To displace existing products and materials, we either need a significant cost benefit or a significant performance advantage of the material. Another issue, which I guess is, is a growing issue, is the one of nanomaterial safety. There's a lot of studies going on around the world, how safe are nanomaterials in reality, and I think that's going to remain an open question for, for quite a long time. But I think barring some major environmental event or some safety issue which is attributed to nanomaterials, I think we are going to continue to see some very strong growth. I think new products will continue to emerge, new materials such as graphene will continue to emerge, new manufacturing processes and improvements to processes will continue aimed at bringing the price down and making the materials more competitive. I think, without a doubt, what I'm, what I'm calling the three E's will continue to dominate, and by that I mean electronic energy and environmental application areas. Um, there's already a lot of products commercialised there. They're what you might call the billion dollar opportunities. However, I believe we're going to see a lot of growth in the other areas, such as healthcare and consumer goods. Um, I mentioned cosmetics already, which is an area where I think there's going to be significant growth. In healthcare, in certain areas such as pharmaceutical development may be slow as a result of the regulatory um, requirements there, but in other areas I think we will see some movement and one area where I'm seeing some activity already is in antibacterial applications. Right now maybe these are hundreds of millions of dollars opportunities rather than billions of dollars of opportunity, but I think we're really going to see some, some activity in that area. So. Um, I guess my, my final comment is, is nanomaterials have been applied in a lot of different application areas. Um, the key really is choosing the right application area for the material. And the question of the day is, what applications within your business could benefit from the use of nanomaterials? So that's, that's really something to think about. So, thank you. Any questions for John at all? Yeah, I, I was intrigued by your example of the bio, the, the diesel fuel and the cat catalytic efficiency that right. was created by nanoparticles. Yeah. Presumably that's quite a lively research area to go to go further than this than this uh, it, it has been, and cerium oxide has been used in catalysts for a long time. It, it's used in the catalytic converter in most vehicles. And this, this idea was a slightly different slant on that. Put the cerium oxide further up the chain, actually <coughs> into the fuel rather than into the exhaust. Um, I, I mentioned that it was very slow to develop, which is true, and I think one of the reasons for that is a product such as a fuel additive, it's very, very difficult to demonstrate whether it really works or whether it doesn't. And there's a lot of non-believers out there right now. Um, the product has been in use for 10 years, it's had a lot of good, good press, but it's one of those things that's very difficult to demonstrate. So in terms of fuel additives, they've always had that slight cloud over them. But absolutely, cerium oxide in the areas of catalysts, um, reduction and pollution, 
improving fuel economies. It's, it's a big area. Are they in organics? Oh, they're in organics, yes. There are others. Yeah, absolutely. Question in the back first. Okay, thanks. Uh, in the food industry, nanoparticles have got the I mean, unenviable position to be almost like GMOs in terms of heavy and dangerous effects on DNA. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Is that just scaremongering or is there something um, well, the, the same issue exists in cosmetics, an area that I'm familiar with. There's growing concern over the use of nanomaterials on the skin. Is it scaremongering? I think a lot of it is. Um, as I said earlier on, there's a lot of work being done. There's a lot of studies being done. The company that I used to work for, we were involved in nanomaterials um, safety studies. We, we supported that and supplied samples and this kind of thing to my knowledge nothing particularly negative has ever been demonstrated but it's one of those things that's always going to be there guilty until proven innocent i suppose that that perception is there and in the food industry it will be there as well um, it's one of those things that i think will will hang around and hinder development to some extent um, but hopefully that will be overcome at some point but i think it's going to be a long time Okay, so one more question for Paul. Yeah, it was just really to, if you could say a bit more about the antibacterial applications. Okay. So what uh, materials and what applications have been described okay. for antibacterial? Um, it's, it's one of the areas uh, that we pursued with zinc oxide, actually. Um, zinc oxide has some natural antibacterial activities. It's used in nappy rash cream. It's used in a lot of these treatments and ointments. And we, we developed, and other people have also developed, um, nanoparticulate zinc oxide and other oxides for incorporation into fibres, into fabrics, into polymers. And we did actually explore looking at um, putting zinc oxide nanoparticles into plastics for antibacterial. And we did get one product actually into the market in a toilet brush. So zinc oxide at something like 5% was actually incorporated into the handle of a toilet brush. For antibacterial um, application so it's that kind of thing but I, I think there's it can go a lot further than that um, into transparent wound dressings and this kind of thing because if you have the right particles dispersed in the right way they're transparent so you've got the issue where you can actually see a wound without taking the wound off and if there's an antibacterial additive in there as well as with any wound dressing that's that's a benefit so I, I think that's that's an area where we're going to see some growth